Good morning. Uh, <laughs> see, what you guys don't know is Finney and I have a little contest, and I always try to see if you'll respond better to me than to him, so thank you for obliging. My name is Carmen Bookma. I am the associate lead pastor here. It is a privilege to be together this morning and to get to share in a teaching time together, and I wonder if as we start, if you could come with me for a minute, and we're just gonna talk through a typical day for us. I recognize this room represents a lot of different people. We're all at different ages and stages, so humor me, I know not all all of these will be relevant, but as we just think through what a typical day might be, come with me on this little journey. So you wake up, and depending what kind of person you are, the clock on the, the time on the clock is gonna say something very different. Maybe you're a morning person, maybe you're not. Maybe you have little kids, and it actually doesn't matter if you're a morning person or not, they will get you up. And before you've even gotten out of bed, you've reached for your phone. And social media has this way of telling us how liked we need to be what events we've missed out on, what we're supposed to think and feel about the current issues of the day, and the opinion that we need to form about the hot button topics that are out there today. We roll out of bed, we stumble our way to the bathroom, and we catch a glimpse of ourselves in the mirror, and maybe we like what we see, we've worked hard, Maybe if you're like me, the 6.30 a.m. version of me isn't quite what I love to stare at. And you take a look and you assess and you think I could stand to lose a few or or gain a few. And is that another gray hair? And regardless of what, what you think of yourself, the reality is our appearance is something we all need to be thinking about and working on as our day starts as you gaze at yourself in the mirror. And then back to that cell phone of yours. You know that little email icon in the bottom corner? That number of unread emails somehow magically increased in the hours that you slept overnight. And before you've even gone downstairs for breakfast, you're reminded that you're already behind the eight ball on your day. And two words that can describe who you are are busy and stressed, and there is just so much to get to. The kids are already hollering from the kitchen over who gets to have what kind of cereal that morning. And as you stagger down the stairs, you remember you forgot to fill out the permission form and the class trip is today, or that adult son that lives across the country hasn't even texted you back in the last three weeks. And this whole idea of parenting, it's eight in the morning, you're not even sure if it's something that you're very good at anymore. Or maybe the opposite is different and you wake up to an empty house and you're very clearly reminded that things now aren't how they used to be because that relationship didn't work out or those adult children that don't live at home anymore. And the reality of being maybe divorced, maybe lonely, hits you again. Finally time to head to work, you drive into the parking lot at work and you're quickly reminded of the wealth status that you have because the guy's car next to you is a bit of a clunker and you frankly have the newer model, but as you look down the row to those reserved parking spots, you realize you have a little ways to go yet. And it's not just the parking lot that reminds us of how much we have and what we don't have, but everywhere we look and go, we are reminded of the wealth that we do or do not have. And you step into a meeting and you sit down (laughs) And very quickly, all those insecurities that you keep shoving to the back come to the surface as you look around and say, I don't have the stuff I need to present well like my colleague does. And the words that people have spoken into your life over the years, if you really are kind of shy, you really need to put yourself out there more, start to come back. And that promotion you've been hoping for from work actually isn't going to come because you don't promote yourself enough. And whatever way that looks, maybe you're sitting in your class at school and those same thoughts are flooding through your head as you look at the grade you hoped you would get but didn't, as you look at the cluster of people around the cafeteria lunch table that you are not a part of, and status is something that surrounds us. But you did, let's not forget, you did nail it at the lunch table that day. You had them eating out of the palm of your hand in the lunchroom. They thought you were hilarious. And you're reminded that you really are a dynamic person. You are funny. In some cases, you're the life of the party. And maybe you love that, or maybe you're tired of it. Or maybe, as you sit around the lunch table, you realize, I don't have a social calendar like the people around me. And I'm kind of alone. And we could keep going. We could fill this sheet with all sorts of things, but in the span of not even an entire day, 
We have been bombarded on all sides by all of the things that we hold, the things that frame us, the experiences we've had, the influences, the words and ideas that frame how we see ourselves and the truths that we live out of. And this morning, in case you haven't caught on yet, we are talking about the idea of identity how it's shaped and how it influences our everyday lives, these choices that we make and how we see ourselves. And I am personally very passionate about this topic. I think this idea of identity, where we place our value and where we place our worth, worth is at the core of how we then choose to engage in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's so important to talk about on a regular basis. And so that's where we're going this morning. And in John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus says these words, I came so that you could have life and so that you could have it to the full. I don't think we always experience this. I think there are so many days that we could describe as mediocre or flat or empty. But there are also days that do feel like the best day ever, but often that's tied to an experience we've just had or the circumstances that have surrounded us. But if we believe these words of Jesus to be true, which I do, then why so often do they not describe how I live out each day? What is that full life that God came to give us? And I think this list on this chart paper is often the reason for this. The place we choose to put our identity, you can call them whatever you want. You can call them masks, labels, roles we have to fill, titles, but at the end of the day, when we try to place our value and our worth in the things that the world convinces us to, we will come up flat. And so that's where we're headed this morning, and we're gonna dig into scripture to look at that a little bit. So if you have your Bibles, you can start turning there, and if you want one, our ushers have them for you. You can flag them down by raising your hand. We're headed two places this morning. We're gonna look at Exodus. Some of those scriptures will be on the screen, but you can stick your finger there anyway. Exodus three, and then Romans eight is where we'll be landing this morning. As you're turning in your Bibles, I do want to highlight, I'm very excited for the next series that's coming up. In light of Peacemakers launching, we're launching a Peacemaker series on restoration and reconciliation. And over the next number of weeks, we have some incredible guests joining Bruxy as they interview and as they share stories and as they teach us about what it truly means to have restoration and reconciliation. I'm so excited for the weeks ahead. I hope you'll plan on joining us as well. And so as we continue this morning, we're gonna start in Exodus 3. We're going to look at the story of Moses, a part of it, not all of it. And the piece we're gonna look at kind of finds Moses having already left Egypt where he grew up as a boy, has fled Egypt, and now he's living a pretty ordinary life in Midian. He's married, he's tending to his sheep. And the part that we're going to jump in with is this encounter between God and Moses. And God shows up for Moses and he has a task that he wants Moses to do. And pretty much the entire chapter, uh, chapter three and a part of chapter four, we see that Moses spends that whole time trying to talk God out of making him do this task. And if we ever were to think that this idea of identity or wrestling with it is something that's like current 2018, we, something for us to deal with, we're gonna learn pretty quick as we look at Moses. This has been something that people have struggled with since the beginning of time. We actually come by this very honestly. So let's pick up the story, Exodus 3, a couple verses in. Two and three says this, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see the strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. So before we dive in too far, I want to acknowledge, some of you may have noticed, the verse starts by saying the angel, an angel of the Lord, but a few sentences later, we learn that it actually is the Lord. And that's a beautiful discrepancy when you think about it. An angel is a messenger bringing the word of God And just a few sentences later, we learn that this angel of the Lord really is God. How beautiful that in the Old Testament, there already is a messenger bringing the message of God who is God. I'll let you sit on that a minute as we look at this. So the story starts where God appears to Moses and he speaks to Moses. God shows up. I don't know if you've ever had conversations like this. I know I have where I've thought, you know what? It'd be a heck of a lot easier to follow what God has for me if he would just like, 
literally place himself in front of me, maybe put a neon sign, maybe come down and I could hear him with my ears. Well, this is what Moses has just experienced through a burning bush is God. God appears to Moses, God speaks to Moses and he says to Moses, I have a job I want you to do. I want you to go free the Israelites out of Egypt. So after encountering the creator of the universe, this is what Moses says. But Moses says to God, who who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Even after seeing God and hearing God speak, Moses is still stuck here saying, "Who, who am I to do that? And so God doesn't spend time trying to gently caress and affirm all that the precious little jewel that Moses is. God pulls it back to his identity and the way he answers Moses is he says, I will be with you and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So God responds with a promise. He says, let's not worry about that. Let me tell you, I'm gonna be with you. And not only am I going to be with you, I'm giving you the end result. You're gonna make it out of Egypt and you're gonna worship me on this mountain. That's incredible. But then how does Moses respond to that? Oh, well, what if, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't believe me or listen to me and they say the Lord didn't appear to you? He's still so clouded in his own self uncertainty that he, he misses the depth of a promise that God says, I'm going to be with you and you're going to do this. So God says to him, all right, what's in your hand? A staff, he replies. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became, became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. God in his response says, let me prove it to you. I will do a miracle and you can know that you know that you know that I am your God. At this point, I would tend to think that this should be enough to say, oh, oh, okay, I'll step into what you've called, but how does Moses respond? Moses then says to the Lord, uh, you know, okay, that's all well and good, Lord. Pardon your servant, but I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Somewhere along the line, Moses bought into the idea that he wasn't a good speaker. We don't know if he convinced himself of this or if others fed that back to him. It could very well have even been true. But what we do know is that he was about to let this identity, this identity of not being good enough, stop him from doing what God wanted him to do. Even after God appeared and spoke and promised and proved himself. Moses was left saying, but I don't measure up. He did end up stepping out in faith and stepping into obedience and because he did that, he changed the trajectory of history forever. But he stood on the cusp of missing out because of an identity that he had believed of himself. The first part of John 10, 10, which I didn't show you the first time, says this, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And then Jesus says, but I've come so that they can have life and have it to the full. But there is an enemy out there that does not want us to have this. He wants to steal that full life away and one of the main ways he does this is what we've written down on this chart paper. Because we become convinced that this is where we need to place our value, our worth, our identity. And we strive and we strive and we strive, but these things will come up short. And it does beg the question, What things has God called you or I into that we may miss out on because we say, yeah, but I'm not good enough. Or yeah, but God, if you really knew that sin that I keep doing, you wouldn't ask this of me. Or yeah, I hear you, God, but if I'm being honest with myself, I actually want to save time to work more on these things because these things are what are filling my tank these days. Is there a yeah, but that you know you need to address with God? 
Now hear me, it's, I'm not saying that these things are wrong. It is not wrong to be these things. It is beautiful to be the best parent that you know how to be. Having a certain amount of money isn't right or wrong. Being funny isn't a bad thing. Like, let's be honest, I am hilarious. <laughs> but it is when this is where we see our value, when this is where we say this is what I'm striving for, that we miss on the depth of that full life that Jesus came to bring us. Because Jesus says, put me first. Order your life in such a way that I get to influence all of it. Seek me first and let the rest fall into place. And when we do this, when we seek Jesus first, we will find that those other identities pale in comparison. In your notes, you have an empty box, and that's on purpose. This is your chart paper. And so I would encourage you, whether it's in the middle of this message, or as you go home and process, or as you meet in your huddle at home church, what words are on your chart paper, figuratively speaking, that you need to name and address? Let's head to Romans 8 and take a deeper look. So we're going to Romans 8 and we're gonna read the first four verses together. Let me read those for us. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law may be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit. Right from verse one, we don't have to get very too too far into this verse to see the truth of the life that God came to bring us. Paul, who is the author of Romans and the author of a lot of the books in the New Testament, says two words that hold the significance. And he loves them so much that they actually show up in every single one of the letters he writes as you rifle through the books in the New Testament. In Christ. And I think it shows up so often because Paul understands that this is it. This is where the truth and the depth and the significance of who we are meant to be is lived out in Christ. Because it points to the significance of a new way of living. The entire framework for those who choose to follow Jesus is shifted. It's a paradigm shift because Jesus is now who we live out of. All of the things that make up who we are as a person, the labels, the identities, you can call them what you want. Hi, I'm Carmen, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a pastor, I'm an athlete. I'm not very good at that, I'm very terrible at this, I'm very insecure about this. All of these things that we think make up who we are is now a paradigm shift because we are in Christ and that is who everything else is lived out of. And often we don't embrace this truth and we fall into old patterns, which is why we find ourselves attempting to live out the identities that we've put on ourselves. But Paul reminds us it doesn't have to be this way. For those that have chosen to live in Jesus, there is no burden, there is no weight. There is freedom from sin and death. Sin that so often causes us to be stuck with some of the labels we've given ourselves. Sin that says you've done that and you need to carry that name with you forever. Sin that says, I will never measure up to who God wants me to be because if only he really knew. That's a lie. And Paul is saying, if you are in Christ, let that go. There's no burden from that. There is freedom from that, and that is the full life that Jesus came to bring, one of freedom, where we can confidently step into anything God asks us to do because we don't need to worry about the stuff we've left behind. We are given a life led by Jesus through his spirit. So we're gonna jump from verse four to verse 14, and I'll just acknowledge, verses five to 13, you're gonna chew on a little bit more this week in home church, but to summarize, Paul uses those verses to contrast this life and death that exists for people who choose to live in Jesus and those that choose to not. The spirit of God is living in those who follow Christ, and this is our identity. And with that, let's pick it back up at verse 14, and it says this, because those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. 
and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Those who are led by the Spirit are children of God. That is your identity. Now I wanna highlight this word adoption for a minute. We all understand the concept of adoption and what it means and we understand the analogy that Paul is making but there is an historical significance that would have caught the eyes and the ears of the readers of this passage at the time because the Roman law back in that day said that for a son to be adopted actually gives them a higher elevated status than a biological son that when it comes to matters of inheriting the estate and succession, to be adopted means that they are given a higher elevation and actually sons and slaves in these sorts of matters were on the same playing field. So when they hear the words that you have been adopted and you are entitled to the same inheritance of Christ, that would have hold such a weight for them. You can see this quote in your notes. It's from a historian and a scholar who studied and he said the Roman Syrian law book actually lays down the principle that a man can never put away an adopted son and that he can't put away a real son without good ground. It is remarkable that an adopted son should have a stronger position than a son by birth, yet it was so. And you'll see in your notes a few other references to Galatians and Ephesians and I'd encourage you this week to check them out because Paul speaks of this again and again and again and he's using words like slaves and adopted and inheritance and who we are in Christ. And these words would have been so significant to the people of the time reading them. To be adopted gives the person full rights to the inheritance. And so I wanna stop because you may have been caught on the word sons and your brain may have gone to the point where you're like, well, there they go again, the women don't entitled to anything. But it's important for us to understand historically, women weren't a part of the discussion when it came to matters of estate and inheritance and their status in that society was lower, which actually makes this statement so much more profound (laughs) because Paul, when he writes to men and women and he says you, have been elevated to the highest esteem as a child of God, women were instantly in the kingdom of God, taken from essentially being nobodies to elevated to the same level and entitled to the same inheritance. So don't let the word sonship uh, hinder you. Celebrate that that actually enveloped the women and the men that all were called to be children of God. And that's us too. It's a Stampsies, it's a Noah Racies. When we are brought into God's family, when we choose to follow him, we are made co-heirs with Christ. Our ultimate identity are as sons and daughters of God because of Jesus and what he did when, and I hope these next words are familiar to you, when he came to this earth, he showed us God's love and he saved us from sin and he shut down religion and he set up God's kingdom and we can choose into that when we choose to follow Jesus and when we do that, we are living the full life that he came to bring us. And that is where we need to find our significance and our value and our identity. And so this morning, I wanna shift away from Romans and share with you a bit of my story. And I do this for two reasons. One, because it's actually relevant, it applies, and you'll see why in a minute. But two, is that you need to know how deeply I value this church community as a family. We are a big family, let's just name that and a lot of us don't know each other yet. But as one of your pastors, my heart is that you know more of who I am as we do life together, as we do community together, as we work out our discipleship journey together. And so it's out of that posture that I want to share with you a piece of my story. And the reason it's relevant is because I am adopted. So it it fits well. And I'm adopted, I I was um, so blessed to be given parents that Uh, just always loved, affirmed, and celebrated adoption. Uh, It was always something that I saw as special, and it was by God's grace that I was just invited into such an incredible family. 
Um, and I never wrestled with feeling abandoned or feeling weird because I was adopted. In fact, the pendulum may have swung too far the other way. I used to tell my friends at school, oh yeah, well my parents chose me and your parents got stuck with you. <laughs> so, you know, maybe we need to rein me in a little, but, <laughs> but it was always this beautiful thing and I never really struggled with it, but even still, there was just this piece of me that was unknown. A piece that I, I didn't look like anyone else in my family. I, I still don't. I don't look like anyone else in my family. And I was always just left wondering, who are they? Who is my birth family? Who's out there? And sometimes if we'd be walking down a busy city sidewalk, I'd look and say, could it be that they have the same color eyes as, and you're always kind of looking because there's this piece of you that just isn't there. And all I really knew about my circumstances around adoption was that my birth mom wanted me to have both a mom and a dad, something she couldn't give me and wanted me to be in a, a loving family. And so when I turned 18, my parents said, Carmen, we actually have a little more information for you. We have a package we've been holding on to. So it's at this point that I said, you're telling me if I had just snooped a little harder in your closet, I could have come across this information. But they hand me this envelope and like any 18 year old, I had a chart paper full of words. As teenagers are often figuring out who they are and I'm convinced that actually doesn't stop. As adults, we're doing the exact same thing. And when I was 18, I did a lot of things. I could do some sports, I could play some instruments, I had some friends, but if I was to pick a word that really summed me up, it was meh, mediocre. I could always find someone who was better than me at any given thing. In any social setting, I never quite felt like I fit, like I belonged. And the words that encapsulated my chart paper so many days were these, not good enough. And so I'm 18, I've got this package, I come up to my room and I'm sitting on my bed and inside there was all of a sudden this information it was like done with a typewriter, because that's how old I am, but there was this information from the social worker from the adoption agency telling me all kinds of information about my birth family, who my birth mom was, what she did for a job, who her siblings were, what she looked like, their medical history, and it was like this piece of the puzzle that I'd never had was starting to be inserted into me knowing more about myself. But there was something else in that package that I did not expect, and that was a letter from my birth mom to me. And I wanna read that letter for you this morning. And it's, it's addressed um, or dated three days after I was born. So after giving birth to me and walking away and trusting me to another family as she left the hospital, she writes this letter to me, and it says this. Dear Zita Gwen, those are the names she gave me, I am addressing you by this name because it was the name that I chose for you when you were born. I chose these names for you because they are the names of two women that I love and respect very much. I wanted to write you this letter and try and explain why I gave you up for adoption. This was a very difficult decision to make. I wanted you to have both a mother and a father, something I could not give you. I also know that there are many couples that want to have children very much but can't have their own. And I hoped that my child would bring them the love and the happiness that they deserved. There are other factors affecting my decision, but I won't go into them all now, maybe someday in the future. I suspect you might want to know about your father. There is very little that I can tell you about him. I only knew him for a few hours. I didn't want to have a sexual relationship with him and I tried to stop him, but eventually I gave up and I never saw him again. Therefore, all I can tell you is that he's an Ethiopian man about 30 years old. And there's just one more thing I want to tell you. Although I am giving you up for adoption, I will always love you. I will pray that I have made the right decision and that you have a healthy, happy life with much love. I also pray that you won't hate me for giving you up and that someday we will meet again. I will never forget you with all my love, Mother. And in that moment, sitting on my bed as an 18 year old, none of this mattered because the one thing that I did not know about my story was that I was the result of a rape. And if God can take something as terrible and horrible as a circumstance like that and redeem it into a beautiful life, then all I need to be is a child of God covered by his grace and redemption. 
And I was sitting on my bed that day and it was like God said to me, Carmen, you are here because I put you here. And the words of Psalm 139 kept flooding in my mind and they say this, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I was planned and I was purposed, regardless of the terrible circumstance that it was born out of. God has ordained every single one of my days. And every time I choose to say that I'm not good enough, I'm missing the truth of what God did for me. And it was in that day that this became my new name, that I am enough. And so while I have an actual adoption story, and I suspect some of you out there do too, the reality is we are all adopted. We all have the choice to choose into being a son or daughter of God. And there may be some of you out there today that actually have not yet chosen to follow Jesus. The stuff I said about being in Christ doesn't actually apply to you yet. Please know today that this truth exists for you too. We can choose to embrace or reject the adoption that we are presented with, but it doesn't change the reality that it's there. And so maybe today you, looking at your chart paper, embracing your identity, need to do some good hard work and say, Jesus, where do you fit in this? I want to follow you. And for many of us, we would say we are in Christ. We are choosing to follow him. But how many days do we get pulled back in this direction when he is saying, you are here because I put you here. I have planned and purposed every single one of your days and I have work for you to do. Trust me, I have appeared to you. I have spoken to you. I have promised you. We know these truths. And yet so often we say, yeah, but I'm not good enough. This morning I invite you to to sit in that truth, to sit in the reality, to sit in the truths of Psalm 139 and do the hard work of saying who am I in Jesus Christ? You are a child of his entitled to the inheritance that awaits you with Jesus Christ. I want to finish by reading more of Romans 8. We're sticking in Romans 8 this morning and may these words uh, speak over you and may this truth stick with you as we leave here today and then I'll pray for us as we go. Romans 8, 38 and 39 say this, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. God, we sit in that truth this morning. And I pray right now, God, even as we finish this formal time of teaching, that you by your spirit be doing a transformative work in our lives. You know us so well, God. You knit us together in our mother's wombs. You know the pieces of ourselves we don't even understand ourselves. Would you reveal those things to us so that we know more fully who we are in you? God, I pray that each of us will be drawn closer to you this morning and that we don't leave here this morning without understanding the depth and the magnitude and the profoundness of the truth that we are your children and that is enough because you are enough. We thank you for the ways that you love us. Pray this in your name, amen. Hi, I'm Brexy. Thanks for tracking with the Meeting House teaching. If you want to see more videos by us, just click right here. If you want to see what our youth and our kids are learning, you click here. And if you want to be notified anytime we post a new video to make sure you don't miss a teaching, then you subscribe by clicking right here. Thanks again for tracking with us.